48 hours on the border. It can change from one minute to the next. Our team of journalists spread out across Arizona, California, Texas, and beyond. So we're literally about a block from the U.S.-Mexico border. We take you to the front lines, getting the reality straight from first responders. We need help from the federal government. Those living or working on both sides of the border. Everybody should come in legally. Border crossing is so critical for all of us. And migrants making their way to America. 48 hours on the border, bringing you in-depth reporting to cut through the noise and show you what's really happening. Thank you for joining us as we take you along for 48 hours on the border. I'm Javier Soto. And I'm Nick Saletti. ABC 15 and Scripps News sending more than two dozen journalists to the southern border. Our goal, get the real story from all sides, making sure every voice is heard from the politics to the everyday people feeling the impacts. Over the next hour, we aim to cover it all. We begin with the data. The 2023 fiscal year, which ended in October, set a record for the most undocumented immigrants encountered at the southern border. We're talking nearly two and a half million and multiple times in the calendar year for 2023. The Tucson sector saw the most encounters of all. Immigrants are apprehended at various spots along the border. Some try not to be found, but many show up at ports of entry and others along the wall to turn themselves in seeking asylum. For one rancher, that wall was being built, but then it was stopped along his property. ABC 15's Ford Hatchet took a journey along the southern border in Aravaca, Arizona, listening to that rancher who was pleading for change. As you drive along the southern border, there are large stretches of wall, but then often you just run into these open spaces. This one only covered by barbed wire and a trench. It's something one rancher says has to change. I live here. I know what's going on. Jim Chilton has lived on this ranch since 1991. This is a very southern end of the ranch. I have five and a half miles of the international boundary. A large chunk is covered with Trump era fencing adding on to and in some cases replacing Obama era fencing, which now sits discarded on private land. When President Biden campaigned in 2020, he promised there wouldn't be another foot of wall built. The wall stopped here when Biden took office the first day. He canceled all work on the wall. So where do people go? They come around the end of the wall. About 100 feet from the wall, Chilton has to fix this makeshift gate about once every two weeks. Broken open, he says, by people crossing his ranch. I have found it closed before, but that's unusual. Chilton has five cameras on his expansive property and says he's captured more than 3,000 different images of people crossing his land, many by the cover of night or in camouflage. They don't want to get caught. And then the other group are uh, migrants, uh, men, women, children, they come through here and they walk down this road to try to be apprehended. So there's two different types of people coming across the ranch. The Department of Homeland Security encountered nearly two and a half million people along the southern border in fiscal year 2023, encountering more than 300,000 people alone this past December. Chilton believes it's likely an undercount. I haven't seen any border patrol for four and a half months. Now, they're busy in Tucson processing people that have walked through here and down the road. Even in portions where a wall does exist, there are gaps, even with materials sitting nearby, unused to fill the hole. If you have a wall with gaps in it, it uh, doesn't do a lot of good. As he drives this portion of the wall, Chilton chuckles at no trespassing signs. Something has got to change. Nearly every time he drives this path, he sees migrants. Many dropped at the wall, and he says Border Patrol has told him it's the cartel coordinating the trips. In October, the Biden administration begrudgingly greenlit an expansion of the wall in Texas using funds allocated during the Trump administration. I hope and pray that the next president, I don't care who it is, finishes the wall secures the border. But for now, no plans for new construction here. In Aravaca, Fort Hatchet, ABC 15, Arizona. Thanks, Ford. While that rancher encounters a number of migrants crossing his property every month, he does take steps to try and keep them safe. I have 29 drinking fountains, uh, 13 and a half miles of pipeline, and I put drinking fountains 
so that people can get water if they need to. Jim Chilton says some migrants are told Phoenix or Tucson are just a few miles away only to get stranded in the desert. But he says he puts that water out there because he doesn't want them to die of thirst. And while he wants laws to change, he also wants to keep people from dying on his property. In the meantime, when it comes to the actual immigration laws here, a border bill that took months to put together with Republicans, Democrats and independents, including Arizona Senator Kirsten Sinema, failed back in February, hitting a roadblock in the Senate. Former President Donald Trump leading the charge for Republican senators to sink the bill. In addition to major new funding, the legislation would have imposed tougher new border restrictions once illegal crossings hit a certain threshold. It also would have allowed more asylum officers to decide on actual asylum cases right at the border instead of moving through the immigration courts, which is what we see right now. But a major concern from lawmakers who opposed the bill was that it included foreign aid to both Ukraine and also Israel. On the state level now, Governor Katie Hobbs vetoed a bill, so this would have given the state the same authority the federal government has to arrest and deport migrants. In her veto letter, Governor Hobbs said in part, quote, this bill presents significant constitutional concerns and would be certain to mire the state in costly and protracted litigation. But supporters of the bill say if federal policies aren't enough, then the state needs to step up. Senate President Warren Peterson says they're not going to stop trying. Recently, Governor Hobbs vetoed the first bill that went to her desk. We have several more that are coming her way. A near identical law in Texas is being challenged by the Department of Justice, and it's a really fluid situation. Just this week, a legal back and forth happening over whether it can be enforced while the courts decide on whether it's constitutional or not. An ultimate decision on that could eventually be made by the U.S. Supreme Court. When it comes to processing migrants after they're apprehended by Border Patrol, the agency's own guidelines only allow them to have a migrant in custody for up to 72 hours. And once a migrant makes a credible asylum claim, as long as they don't have a criminal history, they're released into the U.S. while they await their court date. We spoke with an immigration attorney who says currently that court date might not be for quite a while with a case backlog of about 3 million people. I'm seeing a lot of cases um, here in Phoenix set in, you know, 2025, 2026. Um, I know that other immigration courts, you know, you're getting final trials set out in probably 2028, if not further. As a first step to get that court date, in many cases, an asylum officer screens that migrant at the border, and if they're able to prove they have a credible fear of persecution in their home country, they're released while awaiting a court date. That attorney you just heard from says on average only about 10% of asylum claims are granted. There are other classifications that might allow you to stay in the U.S., but true asylum claims are rare. He also says whether you show up illegally like a break in the border wall or legally at a port of entry, an asylum claim can still be heard. Now, that wasn't always the case, though. During the Trump administration, there was the so-called remain in Mexico policy. President Biden got rid of it, but it required asylum seekers to wait in Mexico for hearings in U.S. immigration court. So to this day, some people do wait for their names and numbers to be called, some waiting for months without shelter and struggling to find food. But as ABC 15's Patricio Espinosa shows us, volunteers, including a pastor from Phoenix, are there to pitch in and help out. The sun is going down in Nogales, Mexico, and with the nightfall, a new set of challenges for those hoping for legal entry and asylum in the U.S. Many wait across the border without shelter, often without food. Tonight, they're not alone. Pastor, are you ready? Yeah. Now we're getting ready to go. We're going to go out in the streets right now. We're in Nogales, Sonora. Pastor Ramon is from Phoenix. He moved here, he says, just to help those in need. Every week, he joins forces with the Nogales police, social workers, and volunteers to help the homeless. And among them, we also find those waiting and hoping to walk across the border legally and make their cases for asylum. Most come from countries like Guatemala, Honduras, says this Nogales police officer. He walks with us as we see how the group of volunteers helps everyone waiting. 
And sometimes all it takes is a cup of coffee or a cup of soup, a little bread. In this case, burritos that are being handed out to the people here at the border waiting to go across. Many of them, all they have is a number or a turn. What happens when they go across is yet to be seen. Siete meses, más You've been here seven months waiting. Mm -hmm. Siete meses. Tiene un número. You have a number. Yeah, ya, ya lo tenemos. Okay. Selena is talking about a number assigned to her when she applied for asylum. If her number comes up and she's not here, she says she will have to start all over again. And though Selene has been here for months, she smiles as she gets her cafecito, that one little cup of warm coffee. In the last year and a half, we've served over 4,800 cups of coffee. Cold, but you know what? Just the smiles that seeing the kids there have some soup. I mean, they haven't had nothing to eat all day. It's a blessing to be a blessing. You know? <laughs> they're like in, in, in a place where they don't know what's going to happen, but Thank God that there's people that, that, that care about them and they, they, they see their hurt, they see that there's a need. A blessing, says Pastor Ramon, for those who give and those who receive. In Nogales, Mexico, Patricio Espinosa, ABC 15. Our special coverage of 48 hours on the border just beginning. Still ahead, I'll introduce you to the Arizona nonprofit helping hundreds of thousands of migrants as their asylum requests play out and the impact this has on Border Patrol agents and entire communities. Plus, a driver suspected of smuggling migrants in a high-speed chase near the border. Hear from the deputy almost killed in that dangerous pursuit and how it turned his life upside down. And educating students in a border town, the unique journey they face and the obstacles they encounter. Also, cross-border trade and so much more as we press on with our special coverage of 48 Hours on the Border. Spending 48 hours at the border, so far we've heard from politicians, ranchers, and undocumented immigrants. Right now we head to Yuma, where getting an education can look much different than in other parts of the state. You'll find hundreds of students across the border every single day to get to school. ABC 15's Ashley Paredes takes a look at the many barriers they face in order to continue their journey to a better life. Many people here at the border do it every single day. Deanna Sanchez learned at just nine years old that crossing the border is a way of life. A 15 minute walk can turn into a 30 minute walk because you're getting exhausted. She was born in the U.S. but lives in Mexico, walking to school through the San Luis port of entry since the fourth grade. But she's noticed many things change in recent months, including what she says are stricter screenings. You never know if you're gonna get a secondary uh, revision or maybe they're using the canines, so that takes a lot of time. She says cartel violence also seems to be increasing on the Mexico side. I miss that years before we didn't have that, and now we do, there's shootings all the time. Now she has a car trying to block out the noise as she drives back and forth across the border, working to obtain a higher education. Learning English will be my opportunity to be able to work here. Arizona Western College has its main campus in Yuma, but just three miles from the port is their learning center in San Luis. What is pathos? Emotions, exactly. A smaller, more convenient option for transporter students. Making it to class, though, can be difficult, no matter the mode of transportation. Many students walk to the port of entry, which could be several miles. And then once they get here, it's a waiting game. There's no telling how long it could take, sometimes several hours, which is why it's one of the biggest challenges they face. I'm always stressed about it. I think, how's the line going to be tomorrow? How's the line going to be today? Eviana Rodriguez started going to AWC full time during the fall semester. She lives in Mexico, about 30 minutes away from the port. The lines walking have been horrible. They have been like 40 minutes to an hour and a half and you're standing up. So you have to be alert and you have to be um, looking at your surroundings. Once across, many take a taxi or shuttle to school and back but those can be unreliable. I would get so scared and intimidated by the driver and they sometimes would ask me weird questions like, why would you take this class or do you live alone? Just recently, Evie's grandfather offered up his car, which she will be using on two of her three school days. Although she feels safer driving, there is a lot more planning involved. I just wake up, brush my teeth and change, and leave. So that's like 5 a.m. 
and then if the line is long, I'll do minimum two hours. Depending on the day, she may not return home for nearly 12 hours. Then it's time to eat dinner, sleep, and repeat. A common theme for students. That is tough. That's exhausting. Advising and Student Services Coordinator Omar Hadedia says that's why they are mindful when it comes to scheduling classes. Let's find you one from 8 to 9, another one from 9.30 to 10.30, and then that last one from 12 to 1. And that way you're crossing the border once, you're taking on your three classes, you have time to go to tutoring. Arizona Western College offers many other resources to help students overcome barriers, including hybrid classes, free bus services, and child care, along with general support. Statistics, absolutely. They want you to participate, they want you to be involved. And I really like that because I wouldn't go for it if they didn't push me to it. Evie is the first in her family to go to college and has dreams of becoming a physical therapist. Deanna is still trying to figure out her career path, but she is working part-time as a substitute teacher on top of her academics. There's a lot of complications that come my way, but I'm still here. I'm, I'm, I'm at college and I have a, uh, what I would say it's a very good job. So I am very proud of myself and my parents. Ashley Perrette is ABC 15, Arizona. The city of Yuma is placing more time and effort on making higher education more attainable. City leaders are working on a plan to better understand the needs to top industries and then prepare students with those skills that they need for those roles. In our 48 hours on the border coverage, we're also examining the many components of this complex issue, including a focus on workers. Arizona's largest port of entry located in Nogales and data from the University of Arizona shows each day tens of thousands of people walk or drive across the border just to make a living and support their families. ABC 15's Lillian Donahue is spending 48 hours in Nogales highlighting workers from both sides of the border who help one of our country's top trade relationships keep going. Every crossing, a connection tying Nogales, Arizona and Sonora together. Soy operador de autobús mexicano. Three times a day, Javier Alfaro crosses between Mexico and the U.S. to provide for his family in Sonora. Hago tres cruces diarios. He's one of 10 million people annually who make their way into the United States through the two ports in Nogales. As Alfaro walks to his bus in Arizona, Joshua Rubin, a business executive and Port Authority chairman, starts his daily drive into Mexico for work. I cross typically um, Monday through Friday. So we took an afternoon commute with him south to get a firsthand look at the binational workforce that shapes not just this community. It's, it's what puts food on the table for me. It's what feeds my family. But most every American consumer. This is a company out of Phoenix. We're talking trade, a $28.6 billion value via imported and exported goods through Nogales alone. About half of what comes into the country is going into a manufacturing plant inside Arizona. Produce and manufacturing make up most trade here. Companies from the U.S. capitalizing on factories known as maquiladoras in Mexico for cost savings and a fast commute to the world's largest consumer market. They need their finished good as soon as possible, like same day. So border crossing is so critical for all of us. Many of the American businesses on the Mexican side also run twin facilities north of the border. I'm in an industrial park in Sonora, Mexico. This is the first step in goods that we see every day. Then these goods come to the warehouses here in Arizona before being distributed across the country. You're helping produce and keep jobs in the United States compared to, say, going to China because of that cross-border relationships. Just north of Nogales, Arizona, in Rio Rico. So this is where fruits and veggies come from Mexico before they hit your dinner table. That's correct. Pallets of produce pour into this cold storage warehouse. Serranos, poblanos, habaneros. Like the produce he moves, employee Carlos Lopez relies on getting across the border quickly. He tells me he has two homes, one in Tucson and the other in Mexico, where he spends a night or two a week to cut out travel time for work. Packaged fruit. Warehouse manager Scott Vandervoet says Nogales is not just about its products, but its people whose lives straddle international lines. Too often the border is seen as a dividing entity, a dividing line, whereas what we see it as is more of a connecting structure. It's impossible to tell the story of Nogales, Arizona without its Mexican counterpart. The two intertwine in a day-to-day -day dance for work, family, trade, and tourism. The border is the opportunity to interact. It's the opportunity to do trade and commerce. It's an opportunity in itself. Bridging this Arizona community of 20,000 and Sonoran city of hundreds of thousands into one. 
In Nogales, Lillian Donahue, ABC 15, Arizona. Our 48 hours on the border goes far beyond Arizona. Coming up, we ride along with Border Patrol in the Rio Grande Valley. Plus, we'll explore everyday life in a border city and the funding fight for first responders in one small border town. This was my first time at the southern border. I didn't know exactly what to expect. You know, you hear so much about it either in the news or just reading different articles and trying to educate yourself. But until you actually get eyes, your own eyes on it, it's hard to really put into words what is going on down here. As a producer observing behind the scenes for the past 48 hours here in the border uh, near Yuma, one of the things that really struck me was the sense of community here and people stepping up to do really challenging things for the betterment of this area. Small towns like San Luis, even Yuma, seeing the community that's here. You have people in the face of challenges doing what they can to make this a better place. You know, we went out, we saw what is happening both the good and the bad. Uh, we went out with a sheriff's deputy and we saw migrants who have been in the desert for days. They were lost. They didn't know where they were. They hadn't eaten in three days. At the end of the day, we're human, right? And seeing them and talking with them, they want to be here because they have no opportunities where they're living. Those are just some of the reflections that we're going to share from our team as we continue our border coverage, which now takes us to the Rio Grande Valley. That's right. So our Scripps News Corpus Christi station rode alongside Border Patrol agents to get a firsthand look at the situation on the Texas border. Migrant encounters in the Rio Grande area went down this past fiscal year by 50 percent, but agents are still seeing activity and they say it can happen in a matter of seconds, something our team witnessed firsthand when agents found two men from Mexico hiding in a bush. Both subjects will be transported to the McAllen stations where agents will run their biometrics and depending on their immigration and criminal history, they'll be processed accordingly. Well, the main goal of every shift, protecting the border and of course lives. If I didn't try to stop that vehicle, it was going to go up the road and maybe kill a family. Nearly killed on the job, a Cochise County deputy sits down for his first interview with ABC 15 as part of our 48 hours on the border. Plus, when asylum requests play out, sometimes migrants are either released onto the streets or community organizations have to step in. But the ability to keep up that work may not be sustainable. The battle one group in Yuma is now facing. And the fight for funding with first responders, the challenges Arizona's border towns now face to serve and protect their citizens while also having to take care of people at our border and ports of entry. Welcome back to our coverage of 48 hours on the border. Right now, a focus on local law enforcement. The Cochise County Sheriff says in just the past year, two deputies were almost killed because of criminal activity, all connected to illegal immigration. And he calls it a moral hit to the sheriff's office. And for the first time, one of those deputies sat down with ABC 15 about his near death encounter. Our Nicole Grigg reports. First of all, how are you doing? This is Deputy Chris Oletsky. I ended up breaking uh, my left femur. It would be that first question of how are you doing that became overwhelming, so we cut the cameras. Let's take you back to September 28th. This is body camera video from a Cochise County Sheriff's deputy arriving to a chaotic scene. This deputy is searching for a way to get an ambulance down this embankment. Deputy Oletsky landing down there. He fell off the overpass while trying to put stop sticks out during a pursuit, chasing a suspected driver smuggling migrants from the border. I don't want to move it back home. The audio cuts out. You can't hear anything else. Deputy Oletsky was taken by helicopter to a hospital in Tucson. How are you feeling? 
So uh, I'm feeling good now. I think um, a lot of people would attest that this I got you too. Huh? <laughs> yeah, you did. <laughs> good. You know. I'm not the only one. Yeah. I, um, mean. I think a lot of it's been difficult yeah. uh, in the sense that this incident turned my life upside down. Yeah. Along with substantial brain injuries, Oletsky broke several bones. Broke my left femur, I broke the right side of my pelvis, uh, I broke my right elbow, uh, and I broke this wrist in connection with that um, without getting too much into the details. Oletsky served as a Marine. The reason that why we're doing that uh, is it is a hot smuggling route. And we have gone along with him as he's been a part of the five-member criminal interdiction team assigned to finding people smuggling migrants from the border. They're told to get out of Cochise County, so that commonly leads. As part of our 48 hours at the border, we visited an Arizona group helping migrants in the next step of their journey as asylum requests play out. And as I found out, this group is providing critical help for the Border Patrol, migrants, and entire communities. By the busload, they arrive, hundreds of people, all coming from different places, with different fears and different circumstances. Como te amas? But they all have the same dream, the American dream, just like Joanna Pena. In their eyes, you can see just how exhausting the 3,000-mile journey has been. After getting apprehended at the border, they were processed, background checked, and released by Border Patrol agents as their asylum requests play out. ¿Por qué querían dejar a Colombia? En Colombia, últimamente, había muchas amenazas en locales eh, por bandas. Joanna tells me in Colombia, the threats from gangs are constant. Y me imagino que también quieres darle a ella una mejor vida. Una mejor vida y que ella tenga una educación mucho mejor. Okay. More than anything, she says she wants a better life for her daughter, Celeste. This outdoor tent area is now a transition center where Border Patrol agents take hundreds of migrants each day after they've been processed. Migrants get food, water, COVID tests. They can charge cell phones and use Wi-Fi, all to connect with friends and family here in the U.S. who they'll stay with as their asylum requests play out in immigration court. I was here last May, right before Title 42 ended. Numbers are down slightly from then, but the flow of migrants is constant. It's easy to, to say buses or to say numbers, but we see the human face and we see the suffering that a lot of them have been through. Alex Bejarano with the center says what they thought would last for three months has now gone on for three years. This is a humanitarian crisis on a global scale. This is very different than any other time that we've seen migration coming across the border. Regional Center for Border Health President and CEO Amanda Aguirre says the harrowing stories of violence and e As a human being uh, that happens to be a reporter, you just kind of wonder, you know, what would you do? What would I do if I was in that position? Um, and as the question that uh, sometimes we ask, others. Uh, what would you do? Uh, what do you tell the people on the other side? What do you tell the politicians? What do you tell President Biden and Donald Trump? And what many told us is we would like to remind them that this quote is about people's lives. The day in, day out folks that are living it and using the border as a resource economically, interpersonally, to see family, those who have properties on the other side, it's so much more than a political sticking point. As she mentioned, so much more than just a political sticking point. And a reminder, you can view all of our stories at abc15.com slash border. And we hope our coverage here has been informative and eye-opening and gives you just a glimpse of truly just how complex this issue is and impacting so many people. It does, and a sincere thank you to all of those who have played a part in this truly special piece of journalism. And thank you very much for watching.